on, on our final session. And um, <clears throat> I'm delighted that we have with us today David Blunkett, Lord Blunkett. Um, David uh, is a politician that you know, will not leave much introduction from me. Certainly, if you're, if you're uh, from Britain in this audience, perhaps if you're one of our international students, um, you, his career may not be uh, as known to you. But David uh, started out in Sheffield as a councillor. He became the, the leader of Sheffield uh, City Council. He went on to become a, a shadow cabinet minister and then a cabinet minister in the Tony Blair government, a, shadow, uh, a secretary of state for education and employment, then the home secretary, uh, and then work and pension secretary too. Uh, he's also a professor uh, of politics at the University of Sheffield in the Department of Politics there, uh, and has a lifelong commitment to questions of active citizenship, uh, engagement in democracy, um, which go back a long way, actually, and go back to, and we'll talk about this, uh, David's initial um, uh, development as a, as a politician and, and at uh, the University of Sheffield many years ago. Um, the reason why we wanted David to come and talk to us today is, of course, his career spans a, a lot of the developments that we've been talking about. Um, and how politics has changed ac ac across the course of uh, these decades. Um, so we can put into perspective some of the things that we've been discussing today about post-truth and fake news and Trump and all the rest of it. How do they look in the, in the longer sweep of, of political history, uh, in particular with respect to developments over the last sort of 20 or 30 years? So, David, you're very, very welcome here. Well, th um, thanks for the invite, and above all to the audience for being here, because... Yes, lonely otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> um, I should declare, actually, uh, although uh, I'm now at the University of Bath, I did work for David when he was... With. He uh, with, 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 with. Yeah. Uh, I was one of his advisors uh, in the Department of Education and Employment and in, then in the Home Office. So some of the things we will talk about were things uh, that we did together. And, uh, and so just for complete transparency, you, so you all know that. Um, but I want, to, I want to start, David, just, by, just to give the audience a sense of what you know, took you into politics. Um, and the sorts of commitments that framed you early in life. So you started out, you were very young, I think, as a councillor, weren't you? I was a semi-mature student at Sheffield University. Semi-mature, because I was 22, but I wasn't very mature. <laughs> um, and I got there the hard way by going to evening class. And when I got a job, uh, day release in, the, in those days, and I think it's a really excellent idea, you could get a day a week at college, and my quid pro quo was to go to evening class two days a week as well. And that's how I built up both a business studies qualification, national stu uh, certificate in business studies, and A-levels. I was doing A-levels in the evening. And uh, I, that's how I got into the university. And I, in the first year at the university, I'd been a member of the Labour Party for six years by then. Someone who was due to stand in the the local area in which I lived with my mum, because my dad had been killed in a works accident when I was 12, which did affect my politics. There's no mm -hmm. question about that. Your, your back history, your, your back story affects how you feel and think. And sometimes you have to adjust to that <laughs> a bit as well. Um, not least because I, I could have become obsessed with health and safety. Mm. I eventually had a, a short period in charge of the health and safety executive yeah. And I was very keen to get occupational health up in lights and just started doing it and it died off again. But that's the story of politics. And back in those days, this guy was due to stand and he moved to a union job in South Wales. And they took a risk. I mean, it was a hell of a risk. There was nobody under 40 on the council. There certainly wasn't anybody who couldn't see. Mm. Um, you know, they, they, they must have thought, well, we'll give him a go. Um, and asked me some really weird questions like, how would you deal with a blocked drain? I said, well, I wouldn't put my arm down it. That's for sure. <laughs> so there was a lot of explaining of how I was going to manage without sight, as well as whether I was up to it, you know, in, in the broader sense, in the political sense. And can I, can I just ask you just about the sort of political culture of the Labour Party in that period? Because the change in politics also is a, in part a change in how people come into parties the kind of life of those parties and how they educate people into active politics. I mean, can you just say a little bit about sort of Sheffield Labour politics at that time? Yeah, it was very artisan. It, it's, a, it's a craft city, city historically. And the craft unions, what was then the AUEW, uh, now Unite, part of... TNG had a bit of influence as well. But the craft unions were very predominant. And they didn't just dominate in terms of 
the day-to-day -day politics, they were really responsible for running the party and for selection. So many of my colleagues on the council had come through the trade union route, and I was a member of the trade union, but it was a different... I was coming at it slightly differently. Mm. And they were old Labour with a slightly radical bent. I mean, old Labour was... I mean, people sort of have great nostalgia, but it was incredibly patronising. I mean, just to put it in its context, 90,000 council houses, including the one I lived in, and they were all painted the same colour. Mm. And you had no choice about the colour of your door or your windows, or even inside your house. And one of the early tasks was a group of us trying to break the mould. I mean, I used to think, why would anybody vote for their landlord? Because we were crap. <laughs> and people forget this. I hear it now, people saying, you know, the good old days when everything was run by uh, public authorities. They weren't good old days. There was a lot of good about it in terms of closeness to what was happening, a, a, an, an empathy and understanding, because people were living the same life. Mm. They weren't in a kind of bubble away from it. The Labour Party wasn't dominated by a handful of people who represent seats in London, just to put it in context. Uh, uh, but it was paternalistic, and it wasn't going to last because people wanted to be engaged. They had aspirations to change things for the better. And that was an inhate conservatism in the Labour Party in those days. I mean, again, people forget that people are constantly defending the, 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 the improvements that have been made in the past rather than rejoicing in them and then moving on and working with people about what they wanted for the future. Mm. And we've, const we, we, we've still done that over the last 20 years, but to a lesser degree. And so, um, Sh Sheffield in the late 70s, early 80s, along comes Thatcher, lots of these artisanal jobs uh, in the steel industry in particular are lost. Um, lots of people lose their livelihoods. And that political culture starts to unwind. Now, how, does, how do you... And social, and social yeah. norms as well. 50,000 jobs in three years in steel and engineering. High quality, relatively high paid jobs, but with mm. status. They all go. The full Monty is produced. Don't know whether any of you have seen it. <laughs> From those of you who are outside the UK, it was supposed to be funny. It did capture a moment in time of quite seminal change in terms of social change, gender change, relationship to work. Mm. There were bits of it I found funny. <laughs> there was a sort of Sheffield humour where, you know, somebody's marooned in a car in the middle of the canal and a guy walks by with his dog and just says good morning and carries on walking. You know? <laughs> there is a, a, a degree of humour, but quite a lot of it was very dark humour about what was happening at the time. So that had an impact, and I became leader of the city in 1980, just as those big changes were taking place, plus a, a very right-wing government intent on, on uh, really setting aside the challenge to central government, because local government and the trade unions were the challenge. Mm. They were part of the plurality of the democracy in the, U in, in the UK uh, before we had devolved parliaments and assemblies. So there wasn't the constitutional uh, challenge, but there was a historic economic and social challenge. And we were part of it, and we were caught up as well in, in the city with an influx of, more, of younger, more radical councillors, but also what was happening in the Greater London area, not just the uh, GLC, but the boroughs, uh, and to a lesser degree, because it was not our particular form of left-wing politics, but the militant tendency in Liverpool. In other words, local government was suddenly to the fore in a way it isn't mm. today. Mm. And that wasn't just about challenging central government, it was about rethinking doing politics, about engagement. The, Nick will know a guy called Jeff Green, who's a professor at Sheffield Hallam University. Uh, he and I wrote a pamphlet for the Fabians called Building from the Bottom. Mm. And it was about how to reconnect and how to engage people in neighbourhood planning, in running 
local uh, leisure and centres in trying to get cli clients, if you like, of, of social services involved in what is now called code delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, all these things were embryo there, and then we've lost a bit of it since. But I still go back and look at it. Um, Keith Jackson and I, Keith was at the Northern College, wrote a, a, a rather impenetrable, awful book, but it's... For, the, for, for those of you who can't sleep at night, it, you might <laughs> have a look. It was called Democracy in Crisis, The Town Halls Respond, which we wrote in 1986. And that was really a reflection both of the challenge of Thatcherism and our, and our response, uh, uh, but also about how local government had innovated. Mm. Right across Britain, there was real creativity going on. And so th th this... In contemporary politics, we would say deindustrialization leads to alienation. People are then more susceptible to kind of populist parties, to post-truth yeah. and all of we that. We were a bit populist. <laughs> but I suppose, I suppose... So one question for that is, was it the fact that you had better-funded, empowered local government that was, as it were, able to at least take a lead in responding to those kinds of changes and challenges? The, what, the, you didn't have remoteness of government. The, resor the resource mattered. We had the business rate. We had assets that we could still use. There wasn't capping of the local tax, which was introduced by the Thatcher government in 1986 and made a massive difference to what mm. local government could do. And I, I don't think it's being a, a little bit priggish and kind of self-serving to say I was the only one in the Labour cabinet who consistently tried to get us to abolish capping of the local tax but it became a futile exercise. And as I learned from Tony Benn, it, you don't resign because you really don't want to resign. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let, let me... Um, so we'll fast forward to the sort of mid-90s. You know, Bill Clinton is president, Tony Blair's just been elected leader of the Labour Party. Yeah. What is different in politics by the mid-90s? Massive energy running through the Labour Party and those sympathetic trees. Because it wasn't just the Labour Party. I mean... Pe people sort of sneer now, but on that morning when uh, Tony Blair made a rather naff speech, but it was, you know, it was the moment. A new dawn has broken, has it not? And actually people thought, yeah, it's a sunny, wonderful day. People gathered in very large numbers in central London and around Downing Street. There was a, an energy which, if we could know what we know now, mm. we'd have tapped into even more. We'd have understood that there was a liberation that could have been accelerated of people's thinking and feeling. We could have done more, but not actually done more. We could have actually liberated others to do more. Because I think the, the problem with politics all my life has been that doing things to people, rather than finding ways of using the influence and sometimes the power of government to liberate other forms of power, consumer power, the ability of people to engage in, in the workplace, in the neighbourhood, uh, and work out how to counterweight... There's a big theme of mine, so you've got me on it now. <laughs> how to counterweight globalisation in, in a positive rather than a negative fashion. The, the whole ethos of the post-war era was trying to put barriers up to stop things happening. I was reading the other day about speeches made by wonderful people who were great pioneers who did fantastic things uh, for this country and the Labour Party. And Aaron Bevan, Barbara Castle. If you look at what the, sp the speeches they made at the 1959... Sorry, this is really going back a bit, but if you read what they did, what they said at the 1959 party conference when we'd lost the 51, 55 and 59 elections, with the exception of Dennis Healy and, to some extent, Tony uh, Crossland and Tony Benn, those speeches by, by people like Barbara and, and, and Aaron Bevan were really backward-looking. They were incredibly critical of the emergence of television, as mm -hmm. though television were responsible for people losing the plot and not mm -hmm. voting Labour. Seriously. And so there's been a, there's been a backward-looking defensive element, as there was in the 80s, there's no question about that, in the early ages, the Tories were on the, uh, the, the international theme of the new enlightenment, and there wasn't yet a third way politics.
but some of us were trying to, not just me, loads of people, were trying to think that through mm -hmm. as to how we could actually engage with modernity and with the acceleration of globalization, but actually also find some ways of counterweighting it, mm. which is the themes that Bernard Crick wrote long mm. before that mm. in, in defense of politics in the mm. early 60s. Now, one of, the, one of the critiques of that Labour government um, is that it was obsessed with the media and it was obsessed with the presentation of policy and it was obsessed with um, how, it was, how it was reported. And that led to a kind of corrosion of trust, ultimately, over time, particularly because of Iraq, perhaps. A corrosion of trust. I mean, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you think that's true, that, that, that kind of the converse to your point about Bevan and Castle was that there was this absolutely kind of um, intense preoccupation with the media environment in which you were doing politics that ultimately undermined the, the kind of connections and democratic engagement that you're talking about? Mm, I, I do buy into it a bit. It, it's partly because... Mm. Action is often reaction. It's often to what has happened before. The caution of the Labour government fiscally and in terms of regulation was part, in part a reaction to what had occurred under previous Labour governments and the terrible political electoral consequences of being out, being popular, but being out, popular particularly by the rank and file. We're, it, the leadership's always pretty popular when we're in opposition uh, because you're in opposition. Mm. Uh, but also because of the way in which other things, often outside the government's uh, in immediate uh, power, like what happened to inflation in the 1970s, had a profound impact on people's thinking. And so did the failure to be able to get your message across, to deal with, to be able to come to terms with the media as it was at the time. I mean, it, 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 for many young people now, it seems bizarre, but there was, there was no Twitter. Mm. People didn't text. There was no Facebook. There was no YouTube. There was the print media and the main broadcast media. And we had such a terrible time. Neil Kinnock had had such a terrible time in relation to the drubbing that he got. You know, f fake news and f fake truth and all the rest of it isn't new. Mm. I mean, it was peddled in spades. Yeah. It's just more rapid and more disseminating very quickly because of new forms of communication. But the... But the messages and the rubbish, as well as the potential gain of people being better informed, is still based on the same premise as what you put in, you get out. Mm. Um, and, OK, nutters have got more access to communication than they've ever had before, including vitriol and hatred. But actually, there were a few nutters editing newspapers as well. <laughs> so, uh, you're, so, so you would say that the... Because we've had this discussion a bit today, that... Um, that actually the sort of content of these things and the kind of politics of fake news or post-truth uh, isn't really new, but the kind of context in which it's happening is, is new. Yeah. And do you think that, you know, in, in those circumstances then, that the kind of ideal to which you subscribe and you've written about a lot, as you've mentioned, of a kind of active and informed citizenry that are working together for a common good, that are engaged in democratic institutions and in local civic... Do you think that is a remains a kind of... A plausible ideal, or is it, or is democracy kind of no, much more corrupted no, I, I, now? I, I do. I don't think it's the soft underbelly. I mean, part of the problem when we got into government 20 years ago was that quite a lot of people felt it was the soft underbelly. It was kind of, oh, it's Etsy only. Oh, you know, mm. you've been reading Robert Putnam, and you know, it's sort of, please let's just get on with what we've got to get on with. We can't be messing about with. It. We've got real issues to deal with here, mm. so please don't confuse us. When I became Home Secretary, Tony said. Why do you want to carry on being responsible for citizenship? You know, because you and mm. I work together on this. The citizenship ceremonies, the development of the citizenship programs for new migrants and for those seeking naturalisation, all of that. He said, why do, you, why do you want that you've got... Because the, the Justice Department was in the Home Office at the time. Yeah. You've got enough. I said, yeah, I've got enough, but I'd like something 
that I really like. I, mm. I, I'm not all that keen. I'm going to do it. But counterterrorism, drugs policy, dealing with, in, particularly in 2002, the crisis, when it was a crisis, over the number of mig migrants coming uh, into the country, just sweeping in, they, they were it, critical issues. But nobody in their right mind would have enjoyed them. Mm. You know, they, were, they had to be done, and I'm, I would do it again. But I wanted to do something different, and that people couldn't understand that. Even mm. Tony, who'd been a, a little bit of a communitarian in his early days, you know, he flirted with it. Mm. And then he, and I got diverted, of course, mm. partly because of 11th of September 2001 and issues after that that we're all familiar with. I, I got diverted. And I wish now I'd just kept on banging away much harder. Mm. Because take, take the, the Labour Party at the moment, and it's massively increased membership and the welcome, not quite as much as people thought, but the welcome increase in young people voting in June. Very welcome. Can't, can't dispute it or rubbish it at all. But this is a moment to move beyond the politics of whether we should have a second deputy leader and on to how do we mobilise those hundreds of thousands of interested people into active citizenship in the neighbourhood, not just taking on their local council. We did, you know, we had all that in the mid-80s. You only have to read about it to know the, the nature of futility. But the, the active citizenship, including organising people as consumers of private as well as public service, of taking on the giants in the internet world, think what we could do if we, we don't have to wait for an election, which is not going to happen any time now. It just isn't. The Tories may have bogged up in April in calling an election, but they're not daft. They, you know, their history has been one of holding on to power inside and outside mm. Parliament. Mm. So they're not going to have an election mm. soon. So why don't we have a different form of policy? Uh, that would unite mm. many of us with, with Jeremy if we didn't get bogged. Just tell you a little story. In 1983, because I need cheering up, so... <laughs> in 1983, I got elected to the Labour Party National Executive. This is a story against me, not about me, OK? And we, we just lost the election, hands down. We were hammered. And many of us were turning back in, as we so often did, to internalise our politics. So what happened in the Labour Party was continued to be really important. And I was the only non-MP since Harold Lasky to get elected to the, what was then the constituency section. And I was a bit full of myself. And I'd done lots, quite a number of interviews, including radio interviews, because it was a bit of a novelty, this guy who wasn't an MP, couldn't see, leader of Sheffield, bit of a radical, you know, got on the NEC. I'm walking along the front in Brighton, and I heard some people coming towards me as gospel truth this, and they were saying, it is, you know. And another person said, it can't be. And I thought, bloody hell. You know, they recognised me. And as they came alongside, they said, it is, you know, it's a curly coat retriever. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never forgotten it. And it really did take my ego down a, a notch or two. But how easy is it to internalise your politics? Mm. to become obsessed as to whether George Osborne thinks that Theresa May's, a, a, you know, a Prime Minister, de a dead woman walking, mm. or whether she's chopped up into small pieces in his freezer. You can't have both, by the way. It's quite difficult <laughs> to do both. So, do, but do you think... Um, do you think... I mean, you come to this point about the fact that the Labour Party's had a you know, massive increase in its membership. Um, you know, the, the, you know, clearly more people active, uh, at least in, in terms of joining yeah. the party than they have. So what has happened to kind of make that possible? Because certainly in the, in the Blair days, the party was there to be managed and, you know, OK, you had to turn out on the doorstep for elections and so on. But Blair certainly saw the party as something, not as a resource particularly, but as something that he had to kind of manage and keep in tow, as it were, as he went through governing. Um, I mean, that may be unfair, but that's certainly kind of uh, how people view it. Um, what has changed that the, the, now this, the Labour Party, you know, what is it that has attracted well, people, brought them in? He, he, here's a thought. Actually, there was a real commitment to increasing party membership and involvement 
in the 1990s. You wouldn't think so to hear anybody. But Gordon Brown and John Prescott, uh, Robin Cook, just to mention a few people, mm. were really committed to getting the membership up. And actually, the membership was very substantial mm. in 1997. It dropped off, partly because we were in government and we got blamed for things that mm. we did or we didn't do, uh, and particularly after 2003 and, and Iraq. But actually, 97, including the turnout, uh, the population and the percentage of the popular vote that we got, and, and the membership was very large. Mm. Uh, and that's why I think I'm interested in the challenge of how to hold on to it, how to make people feel it is worthwhile, not just to be an effective, vibrant opposition, mm. but how to hold on to it in terms of making it work inside mm. the political arena rather than outside. Yeah. So let, let's, talk, let's talk about a few... Um, other contemporary issues then so for those if if anybody's tapped into the blog the dog was just having a scratch and i just had to <laughs> stop him doing that um yeah. uh donald trump um i mean you've seen you know presidents come and go you've dealt with foreign governments um is this is he a new kind of leader a post-truth populist leader or is he just a kind of charlatan who's got lucky do you want an academic or a <laughs> <laughs> personal answer? I think he's a complete charlatan. But I think he, be, he became possible as a president because of the Tea Party movement mm. and the subliminal change that that brought about. And two other things that I think people talk about but they don't necessarily put centre stage. One is the slow burn, and it's true here as well as in America's uh, Rust Belt. The slow burn of industrial decline. Mm. In other words, it, it did, the impact wasn't immediate, but it was there burning away like a candle. And then the global meltdown, starting with the subprime mortgage crisis in the United States, not as the BBC seemed to think with Northern Rock collapsing uh, in Britain. Mm. And that, those two together, it, coupled with, and here's a lesson for all of us, coupled with the dismissal of a highly middle-class liberal democratic party centred on the centre and increasingly out of touch with the people they sprung from and originally represented, including the, the core of the trade union movement. I think it rings bells here. Mm. We've got to be very careful about that. We can win London now any time you like. We'll win the mayoral election next time. We did incredibly well in the general election. London is a country apart to the rest of Britain. Mm. Mm. And do you, do you think it's possible for um, politicians, particularly of the centre-left, to kind of, as it were, bridge some of those socio-economic divisions between people that are doing well in cities like London, those who you know, still suffering from the legacy of deindustrialization, to, as it were, to, to bring those voters together in a kind of common project? Yes, I think it is. In part, Tony Blair did. I mean, no, nobody wants to hear it, but um, mm. whilst on June the 8th we, we won Canterbury and, and Kensington North, Actually, on, in 97, we won a whole plethora of seats across Essex and Kent mm. that we'd never even dreamt that we would win. And therefore, there was a connection with, I don't know how you'd describe it sociologically now, but the lower middle class. Mm. Bear in mind that the, your traditional working class, you're completely alienated, you're non-voters. Uh, are those mainly on welfare and, and uh, generationally unemployed. M many people who I would describe as working class and who are from the background I was from on a council estate in North Sheffield are really now lower middle class and very aspirant. Mm. And whilst they've been hit very hard by austerity and particularly in relation to their their income versus their expenditure, as we see, and that obviously has an impact, their underlying attitudes and tendencies haven't gone away. People are more socially liberal, 
But they're also economically and fiscally, as they always have been, and we mustn't forget that. Mm. Let, me, let me ask you um, about the sort of practice of politics in an age when uh, facts aren't trusted and when... Um, we've been discussing this a lot today, that it appears that if you try to respond to lies, misrepresentations with your own, uh, as it were, demonstration of the evidence and facts, people either discount it, don't believe you, move on, and then instead of a politics of that, you need a kind of a much more emotional and resonant politics that doesn't give up on evidence, but can connect people's feelings to their politics in a way that isn't... Is that your kind of experience of it? Because I'm thinking particularly when you were Home Secretary, that, you know, crime statistics are published, statistics on immigration are published, and going out and saying, no, these are the real facts, crime is falling or immigration is falling, whatever it is, just doesn't seem to have any sort of purchase. It doesn't settle the argument politically. Well, we, we had, when you were working with me, massive bills, Criminal Justice Sentencing Act, uh, domestic violence, uh, proceeds of crime, two big immigration bills, but we had a small bill, and we, we didn't really need the bill, but Tony persuaded me that we did, because we had to demonstrate what we were doing in other areas by focusing stiletto style that Tony Benn used to describe be, before he became very left-wing. Um, and it was called the Antisocial Behaviour Act. And we concentrated really hard on the day-to-day -day experience of people who were experiencing very low-level crime and nuisance and life being insecure and, and unpleasant. And in doing that, we begun to get across the enormous change in the drop in other crimes that were taking place. Mm. So that people started to believe in their own lives that something had changed. People said, well... Why did you do this? Jack had introduced antisocial behaviour orders. I adapted them. Why, 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 why are you placing so much emphasis on this? You know, it's, it's rubbish, isn't it? Well, I don't think it was, actually. I mean, who discusses antisocial behaviour now? Mm. Um, who discusses the balance of trade now? I only say that because Aaron Wilson, 40 years ago, made it a complete fetish. It, it had the exact opposite effect to what was required. So you can get this wrong as well. You can do something that you highlight yeah. that becomes a rod for your back, or you can do something that you see through and actually enables you to get messages across. I think we did that on the crime thing. Well, immigration was really difficult because people in the room might not know, but we were desperately trying to keep a balance between managed, controlled, transparent, uh, inward migration for economic purposes and clamped down on illegal migration and the misuse of the asylum system. And it was a very difficult road to tread, a road to, to, to walk, wasn't it? Mm. Really mm. difficult. Um, and I'm not sure that we, we entirely pulled it off. What we did do was to see off the far right without actually speaking the language or playing into racism. Mm. I mean, sometimes I was accused of seeing off the far right at an expense, but the rest of Europe were experiencing a massive drift to mm. the right. Mm. Pim Fortune in Holland, right-wing uh, regimes uh, uh, elected in Austria and Denmark. Uh, Holland and Denmark were the two most liberal countries in Europe, experienced a massive surge of the far right, which we managed to deal with. Yeah. And do you think... I mean, I know you've been asked this before, but a lot of people here in this audience... Um, will come from other European countries and, and we'll know about the, the debate, certainly, as, as it relates to Brexit. Um, the, the question in 2004, when you were Home Secretary, of saying that uh, nationals from the A8 countries, the Eastern European countries, mm. could come to work in the British labour market. And I think you've been asked before, you know, do you regret making that decision, that they were given immediate access? Um, and I don't. I'm one of the few people who've not sort of done a somersault and said, oh, yeah, that was a big mistake if we... Mm. If we hadn't done that, it would all have been all right. Rubbish. Absolute, total rubbish. 40% of the people who registered to work and pay taxes and national insurance were already in the country. They just... They were here illegally. Mm. And when I talked to my colleagues, it was Nicolas Sarkozy at the time in France and, and uh, Otto Schilly, who was the interior minister in Germany, 
they were very honest with me. They said, you know, what you're doing is entirely logical. We know we are, we have, and we will continue to have very large illegal inward migration. But we've got much higher unemployment than you have, and they had, including in Germany, much higher. Mm. Twi twice the level of unemployment. We have very large numbers of people who are working in the service economy as domestic uh, workers uh, in people's homes. If we, if we legalise them, like you're doing, we'll have a real backlash. Because uh, they'll have to declare them to begin with. A, a bit like happened in America, where when they were discussing legalising uh, the very large number of people from Mexico and, and Central and South America, there was a real panic because people were then fingered for having illegal migrants working in their homes. Mm. Uh, so, including the person who was going to be nominated as the Labour Secretary. So, you, 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 you could see why they weren't going to do it. Now, had, has it had an effect? Of, co of course the numbers were larger than we expected. But the real change in perception was from about 2011, 2012. And the seven-year uh, transition period would have run out by then. Mm. Uh, and we'd have been dealing with a, a situation of opening the doors uh, with our low, un low unemployment, OK, zero hours and mm. insecure and all the rest of it. Low unemployment at a time when other parts of Europe were experiencing... A, a different economic perspective. Mm. So I think, honestly, that, OK, we could have managed the messages better, but the decision to do it legally, openly, transparently, to get people to be here legally rather than illegally, to have them pay taxes, to be able to send home remittances, to build the economies of, of, uh, of Poland, and subsequently... Romania and Bulgaria, who were on uh, a time-limited, regulated basis. They weren't part of the straight open door. The, the, the numbers coming in, by the way, from Bulgaria and Romania did not exceed, and there were no pressures of exceeding the limits that were put on them, mm. interestingly. Yeah. And the, the people who really get my goat the most are those who have been very happy to be served in restaurants or to have people repairing their homes uh, who would like these people not to have been here in the first place. And would you, just one final question for me then, Did, would you then say that we should stay, that Britain should stay in the single market and the customs union accept free movement still? Well, I, I'd have preferred us to have just stayed in the European yeah. Union and tried to change the European Union to a less bureaucratic, nightmarish organisation, which it is. I mean, you only have to hear yeah. Michel Barnier to know that they've lost it really. I mean, him and David Davis deserve each other. They really do. <laughs> the, tr the trouble is, we, do we don't. Um, and, th and that's the problem. I think we've got a real, a real difficulty. If we stay in the single market of the customs union, we can't do deals outside. Uh, so we, we... And Norway obviously pay in, but they don't have a say. So you end up with the worst of both worlds. I, I think... I'm, I'm sorry, because I like Tony still, one of the few people who still... Uh, believe he was a great Prime Minister despite Iraq. I think he's entirely wrong. I don't think there's a cat in hell's chance that we cannot come out of the European Union. So all we can do is to try and persuade the other 27 that actually a special deal which allows us to have fringe entry into the single market and the customs union is good for them and therefore it's good for us and therefore we, we do a deal that's beneficial to both of us, but it won't allow open, free movement. We can get round it, we can have all sorts of tweaks that allow people to come sensibly uh, here to work uh, and to go home if people want to. But the Prime Minister, believe it, the Prime Minister has got this in her head as the one thing she really won't shift on. She'll shift on all sorts of things in the next two years, which I think she'll last two years. But not that. Mm. OK. Right. Let's, um, let's have some questions, then. Let's open it up. I'll start with Matt Dancona. Yeah, Matt. Um, have we got a mic? We can... Yeah. Thanks, folks. I like I liked Matthew when he wrote for the Sunday Telegraph, so you can tell I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day. Nice yeah. to see you, David. Um, I, uh, I was just thinking to myself, I, I, I wish you were still in the Cabinet. I think things would be appreciably better. But I was also thinking of... Um, uh, 2001, when you 
published a rather interesting book called Politics and Progress, which was full of mm. thoughts and ideas and references to Bob Dylan and a vast variety of, of sources and, 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 and just a whole variety of inspirations. Guess who helped me with that? I, well, I, I could see Mr. Pierce uh, uh, blushing. Um, the civic republicanism. The, the, like the, the, there, there, is, there is a serious point behind all this baronising, which is um, uh, you were Home Secretary at the time. And what's interesting is that very few books like that by senior holders of offices of state, high, high officers of state, have been written since. In fact, I can hardly think of any. And that must reflect more than just intellectual indolence. Uh, it must reflect something to do with the changing practice of politics, which is something that's been talked about a lot today. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could say something about that. I mean. Is it just that politicians don't have the bandwidth anymore to think big? They write after they've gone, don't they? I haven't written very much. I wrote a, uh, an impenetrable 872-page diary, <laughs> uh, which is really for people who just want to dib in and see what I was saying accords with what other people were saying. And I hope it'll be of some interest mm. in years to come. But I'd like to write... Even now, I'm, I'm trying to put the archive together at the University of Sheffield to try and get it in some order, and then I might be able to write a bit more about it. I think partly people felt that they didn't have the time, and I, actually, I didn't have the time, but I, you just needed to get things off your chest, to think about the future and what was going on around you, and not just the grind of doing the red boxes and pr producing the goods on a a Today programme interview. So that was a, one driving force. Certainly, I'm really interested in ideas. Mm. In ideas for the future. What's going to happen to the world of... Not as, as crazy as the BBC have been producing... I'm sorry, I love the BBC. I'm having a go at them. But they, they've had all this stuff from California, you know, Silicon Valley this week, about uh, artificial intelligence and robotics. And it, it is true. This is going to have a major impact. Are we talking about the social and political implications of that in terms of how you distribute the product of the economic outcome of greater robotics mm. and artificial intelligence, which is a social democratic issue, if ever there was one? Are we, are we thinking through what will happen with countries across the world setting timetables for cars that don't depend on the internal combustion engine and the use of oil and what the geopolitics of a massive drop in the demand for oil mm. will be in the future. Are we, are we thinking about the consequences of the last 20 years explosion in new forms of communication and its relationship to people's relationships and how they come together and how we keep the glue together of people who call people friends on Facebook who are not friends at all, uh, people who they have a Twitter, you know, relationship with, and how we deal with the fact that you go into a restaurant, I thank God can't see it, but people are always telling me about people who are round tables with their iPhone out, texting or responding, anything except talking and relating. I hope we'll never get round to artificial sex, because that would be <laughs> the last straw. But it might happen. You know, 1984, brave new world. <laughs> you know, it might. That would be frightening. So I, I think the answer is that we've been very bad at liberating ourselves in the political arena for futurism, for, for shaking ideas out, for being really welcoming of ideas. And... One of the downsides of the current you, you must toe the line inside the Labour Party, it's always been true, but it's true of those who didn't like towing the line as well as those who did, is the idea that ideas might be a challenge, might be dangerous, and that the best thing you can do, and I hear old senior politicians like me saying it in defence of the present leadership of the Labour Party, if you haven't got anything positive to say, shut up. <laughs> well, my thinking is, if you haven't got a new idea and something that will take us forward and is creative and positive, shut up. But please, 
the younger members, great, fantastically good young people inside and outside Parliament. Please think, write, speak, try and, without it making it an emotional spasm, to get on the radio or television, get on the radio and television as well as tweeting it out. And that balance is quite difficult because it's more difficult now to get a print article, as we all know, Matthew knows, than it's ever been. Mm. You might be able to get a blog on, but to actually get something that will have a spin-off, because print still has a spin-off mm. into the other areas of communication. Yeah. Okay, let's, um, let's take some more. So, yeah, la lady in the middle there and then gentleman in front, yeah. Hi, thank you uh, for that. It was really interesting. I've got a million questions, but I've just chosen one, um, <laughs> which is, what would be your vision for Labour? And how can you reconcile the slightly patronising tone that I think a lot of young Corbyn supporters feel has been used to talk about them and the support for Corbyn, when you're then saying that we need to sort of go out and engage with our communities? And I think a lot of us sort of feel... Uh, that we weren't really taken seriously until the most recent general election. And then when people are saying, mm. oh, you know, you need to go out and do your bit, well, I just, why should we listen to you? Which, I, I mean, that sounds rude, but it's no, more no, it's sort of general. No, <laughs> no, it's not rude at all. It's a perfectly reasonable point. And it's one that all of us who were highly sceptical have to countenance and think about. I'm, I'm still sceptical because we've got to get 64 seats just to get a majority of one and because I don't think I, I, I'm on record by the way of saying that I didn't think Jeremy was the problem I thought that the project was the problem the, the project wasn't until May to actually believe that we could get elected on it it wasn't honestly I mean all the way through to the county council elections at the beginning of May where Labour was absolutely hammered mm. into the ground uh, just need to look at places like Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, La Lancashire, uh, or, or, or seats, places that we, we should take easily. We were hammered. And suddenly, things changed. It changed partly because of the complete ineptitude of the Conservatives' campaign. But it also changed because Jeremy and those immediately around him engaged. And I, the manifesto was... Di I don't agree with chunks of the manifesto, not on the grounds that they were too radical, but because they, they, they were actually the very opposite of increased in equality. A lot of it was about satisfying the middle class. Now, that's fine. We've done that over the years and been criticised for it. And Aaron Bevan called it sucking at the teats of the state, i.e. the middle class always doing better out of expenditure on public services, whether it's mm. the better off... Uh, ex-graduate or it's the people who are not entitled to help with childcare or with free school meals at primary. You know, the, the, the better off have always managed, particularly with the health service, to do mm. really well out of it. Now, the, the criticism of us, i.e. people like me who are critical of Jeremy, was that we'd never articulated what we thought was the good thing about the inspiration of young people wanting to get engaged, wanting to be part of a movement and we never said how can we make the social movement connect with the political movement because social movements that don't fail whether it's in the Ukraine mm -hmm. or Egypt or in the UK if they don't connect with the political arena then they eventually run out of steam and expend and they've gone they're a past piece of our history make mm -hmm. poverty history the campaign globally in 2004-05 did connect with the political arena and was highly successful, but people forget about it. So we didn't articulate that. We were just critical. And I now need to be critical of me and people like me for not having put that point across. And if Jeremy can actually continue to recruit, to engage, to inspire and connect with the politics that he suddenly discovered in May was possible, and he is doing, isn't he? Mm. He is doing. I mean, you have to read the commentaries about the change in the nature of the political connectivity of the leadership of the Labour Party in Parliament to see that it's changing. 
I might be wrong. I wrote when he was elected that he would either disappoint the electorate or he would disappoint his supporters. I might be wrong. He might be able to satisfy both. OK, very interesting question. Right, uh, yeah, gentleman here has been waiting in the middle, yeah. Um, it's just a, a quick question about Trump fake news um, the, and the sort of stuff that we've been talking about so far. Um, there must be UK politicians who are looking at Trump's success and thinking about how they might emulate it. Um, what do you think the prospects are for, as it were, a British Trump, assuming you don't already think that that position has been filled? No, I, no, no, I, I don't, actually. <laughs> Um, my criticisms, of, I hope, have been a bit more serious than that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think so, uh, because the Labour Party has stabilised. If the Labour Party had been hammered into the ground on June the 8th in the way that looked possible on May the 8th, then I think there might have been a, a, a Macron-like surge for a, a new party. I think that is now dead. I think there's not a chance that that's going to happen. And there's certainly no chance that the Conservatives will break apart. They will, they will do what they always do. They will find a leader that will uh, appeal, or they think will appeal, to the electorate. Um, it certainly won't be Rhys Mogg, that's for certain. <laughs> um, and the, the reason for that is that Trump only managed to succeed by bludgeoning his way through the established Republicans. So he didn't come through on a new party. Mm. He took over. He, he, he did a, a sort of Harry Potterish sort of thing of, uh, of the black arts of taking over the Republican Party and being able to use it. And the only thing that can give us some hope and restraint on Trump is that he actually relies on the Republican Party that he took over. And in Congress, in the Senate and the House of Representatives, and to some extent because of the, the way that the Supreme Court operates, I actually think that they are so horrified with what they've done, what they've allowed to happen out of the, out of the box, that they will be the restraining activity. So it's almost the other way around to your question. Mm. Okay, let's. Um, yeah, gentleman here, yeah, and then. And James, yeah, yeah. So, um, so there are two, two main ideas I think that we've been talking about today fake news as one, which is intentionally passing off falsehoods for political gain, and the other is post truth, which has been described as an appeal to emotion in the, in, in, with disregard to facts. I think something is missing from that, from that formulation, which is that emotions are motivated by something, and they are things that people care about, their values. I wonder if you uh, detect uh, an interest in a broader exploration of values in the British and European electorate now than there has been before, perhaps as a function of the greater opportunity that people now have for sharing opinions on the way the world may be. Mm. I can't give you an immediate answer because you've made me think and I'm going to go away and think about what, what would we mean if we assumed that there was a greater engagement with an interest in values as opposed to a greater interest in the reality, the factual reality of, of what has to be done. I think after the, the, uh, the referendum people have been quite shaken. And I think there is a greater interest in trying to engage with, to understand what the big issues are, but that's not quite the same thing mm -hmm. as engaging with and being prepared to countenance a, a greater understanding of the values that underpin it. Mm -hmm. If we could move from being interested in what's about to happen to us to how that is underpinned by values, then I think that would be a really positive, uh, out of, uh, a positive outcome out of a disaster. Mm. That we actually got people to think through what, what are the values that we hold dearest 
We've got a select committee that, I, God help me, I'm sitting on. In the, I never thought this would happen to me. I'm sitting on a select committee in the House of Lords. <laughs> How are the mighty fallen? Um, and it's about citizenship and um, public values and engagement. And so we, we've got lots of witnesses coming through. And what's interesting is when you get people in front of you who think we'll talk about values, they don't. And so how do we relate the practicality of people's horror of what's going on or hopes for the future embedded in the values that we always talked about? John Prescott used to talk about, you know, what was it? it what, new, what traditional was it? values in traditional a modern setting. Traditional values in a modern setting. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure. Huh. Uh, I think we really need to have a much deeper thinking session about what we mean. Okay, very good. And then Thank you. James, yeah, James. That's a, probably the last question, I'm afraid. So, James, yeah, James Copestate. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are lots of ideas that we've been mulling over uh, to explain recent political events, and, uh, and one of them I'd like to uh, uh, hear your views on is this distinction between uh, anywhere and somewhere people. And I suspect this room is full of lots of uh, anywhere people who are uh, well on their way, if not they're already, to being global cosmopolitans uh, who have done very well out of globalization and so on, uh, and if they get their degrees and, and, and so on, and will continue to do well. Uh, and, and so the, the argument is that uh, Brexit and to some extent Trump are the revenge of the somewhere people uh, and, and, um, and that there's a substantive agenda there which uh, can't be ignored no matter how much we might be, or some of us might be irritated by it. So my question is about the practical politics of how, whether we're talking about Corbyn or whether we're talking about the, the Democratic Party um, coming to terms with Sanders, uh, where um, left parties can reconnect with the local uh, and, the, and the somewhere, uh, particularly because it's clearly something to do with generations, that uh, younger generations maybe uh, don't hold on to some of those localist values, uh, but unfortunately a lot of old people around, um, including you and me, um, uh, and a lot of people of our age and, and higher do hold on to those values and vote. Yeah, and it, it's, it is the challenge both for the Democrats in the United States and for Labour here, although uh, if, if, I, if I, I don't want to upset anybody, but I think quite a lot of people who have recently joined the Labour Party may not accept that premise. So let me try and say why I accept it and why I think the challenge is possible, but it does need some thinking through. If you'd said three years ago that it was acceptable for, the, for Ed Miliband to represent a seat in Doncaster, to have as his foreign secretary, Rosie Winterton, who represents a seat in Doncaster, his home secretary to be Caroline Flint, who reps represents a neighbouring seat in South Yorkshire, and his ch shadow chancellor to be, Dennis, uh, to be John Healy, who represents a seat in Wentworth in South Yorkshire, you'd have, you'd have thrown your hands up in horror. But that's what we actually have at the moment, but it's London. Mm. Now, that means there's a greater onus on the Labour leadership to feel and think and reach out to the seats we lost, like North East Derbyshire, uh, Mansfield, South um, Stoke, South Middlesbrough, uh, and the ones we, we actually did badly in, and the ones we need to win. And to say, what is it that we can do to reach out, to be heard, to, to be understood, that doesn't actually throw away the radicalism and the sense of purpose and the outreach to those who are middle class, mobile and aspirant. And I think it's quite a difficult circle to, um, to bridge, if that's not the wrong mm. way around. Yesterday we had um, presentations a little bit on this, although it didn't go as well as I'd hoped on this select committee. David, what's his name? Um, Goodhart. Goodhart <laughs> wrote that book. Was it, was it some... Anywheres and somewheres, yeah. Yeah, same, same question. And he was in front of us and I asked him about this and he, he's very good at posing the question, but he didn't have an answer. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure I've got one, except I grew up in an area which is very fundamental. You know, 
the, the seat I represented and the seat I grew up in and the area of South Yorkshire voted very heavily in South Yorkshire to come out of the European Union. And tragically, Sheffield was the only university city, the only city of any size, with a radical history that voted 51-49 out. And I, I, I live there, and I, I still go into the constituency with the consent of the uh, new MP, and I talk to people, not least at football matches at Hillsborough, and it's, it's a kind of resentment that the people they see here believe are running the show still don't get them, don't understand what mm. their life is like. And I don't anymore. I did. I grew up there. I earned 12 quid a week before, I, you know. And I knew what it was like to be on an estate where people had high status and great inequality. And I, I don't... I have to pinch myself. I have to go back and talk and stop eating nice dinners in London and talking to people who've never been north of Birmingham for a very long time. And we've got to do that. And it won't be done at rallies or at Glastonbury. It has to be done, and he's good at it, by the way. John McDonald's not so good at it, but Jeremy's good at it. Come and just sit down and sit in a pub, sit in a vegetarian cafe, <laughs> <laughs> and talk and, and hear and relate, because it's a different world. It really is a very different world. Can I just, just on that final point, David, I mean, you know, in the 1980s, there were people, you know, in Sheffield, you were a public face of that city in the Labour movement. Um, there were MPs who had come from mining communities, steel communities, shipbuilding communities, etc. Um, and a lot of that, obviously, with the kind of professionalisation of parties and stuff has sort of fallen away. Do you think that, you know, any that can come back? That people like, for example, Andy Burnham in Manchester, you know, somebody that you're close to, that you've supported in the past. Is it mayors, is it other kinds of forms of civic leadership that then say to people in those areas, well, here are your you know, advocates, your tribunes, the people that will represent you? Well, it's an important step, because if people are genuinely local and they have some power, you've got to have some power, otherwise mm. people become even more cynical and disengaged. If you've got some power, we genuinely... I use the word advisedly, I mean influence, because power lies with the very powerful. And we're talking here about learning how to manipulate what influence you've got to counterweight the power and to reuse the power in new ways. That's, that, that's for another day, but see what mm. I mean? You, mm. If you've got a little bit of power, a little bit, and you've got some influence, and you've got a voice, and you've got the capacity, because you've had decentralised authority to act, and you've got some resource to do with it, if it's local, it's local. You're really close to people. They ha you have to hear them, and they hear you. And that's how we survived. We, we were doing quite radical things in Sheffield. People used to say to me, we'll wear what we think are your eccentricities because you're actually building houses, repairing houses, improving the school, providing really first-class social services ensuring that elderly people have home helps and free provision. And, you know, you're doing the... Oh, and cleaning the streets, by the way. People really cared about that. Mm. If you're doing that, we'll hear you. And you can, you can engage us. We had a Karl Marx Memorial Lecture. <laughs> it was zany, but it was actually trying to say there was more to Marx than Lenin. And Stalin. <laughs> um, and I don't regret any of that. It was a moment in time. It was a learning curve for me. And I'm sorry if I inflicted some of the things on other people while I was learning. <laughs> Tony Blair said to me, and he's quite right, although it may not be the true in his case of mine, but I think it is generally true, you just learn how to do it when nobody wants you to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there we are. OK, David, thank you very much indeed. That was really uh, enlightening, really interesting. Um, uh, we're very pleased that you've been able to come down here and give thank us the benefit of your wisdom. Thank you very much thank indeed. You.